objectives for today. As a result of this activity, hopefully you'll be able to evaluate some rounding advantages, disadvantages, and options for implementation, and also identify and how to engage some key stakeholders when you develop and implement your plan within your organization. So let's kick it off here and see uh, what we can learn. So the first question I'd like to have you ask yourself, is rounding really right for you? Sometimes um, organizations jump in to the expectation that, oh, we're having trouble with our patient satisfaction or we're having trouble with, with falls or whatever it is, but how do you know it's really ready for you? You know, are you, is it right for you, excuse me? You know, is it going to solve the problems that you're having or is it just adding another layer onto some existing infra infrastructure issues? So I'd like to cover the, for us this morning, um, sorry, um, got a little technical question coming in. Um, so I'd like to, to take our dialogue and discuss it a little bit around four key considerations. Those four key considerations are competence, expectations, accountability, and resources. So we're going to go through and we'll cover each of those and, and give you a chance to kind of think about the things in your organization. I encourage you as you go along, and we will share the slide deck when we're finished, but so don't feel like you have to take notes on every single slide, but I, I really get the overview of this and, and think about the kinds of things that that are happening within your organization. So let's talk about competence first. So how do we know we're really going to be good at this when we get it done? How do we know that we're going to be doing it correctly? And, and within that competence arena, I think we really need to look at three main points. The first of which is what evidence is needed to plan rounding best practices. You want to do the best that's out there and you want to make sure that you're, you have an some way to measure that you're doing the right things in a systematic and standardized and consistent way. So think about what's your staff availability going to be. Before you set up your expectations for outcomes and you look at the evidence of your plan, what's best practices, will you have enough people available to do it the way you think you want to? The second thing under evidence is tech support. If this is going to be an online uh, application versus a, pay, a manual process, or even if you need to have tech support for your education program to educate your staff about what your rounding program is going to be, you still may need tech support. And then what is the measurement that you really want to improve? You have to be very clear that you're not just putting something in that isn't clearly going to give you an output for the organization. So we want to be sure that we think about those things. Who will be the best to support the bedside staff? Think about the staff on weekends. Think about shifts. Think about the people that only work every third weekend. Um, things. I think those are the those are the people that sometimes fall behind the curve when we implement something like this because they just don't have the to the training or to have the support with, that we can provide um, during you know business hours Monday through Friday. The last point under competence is this idea of compliance. So how do we measure and coach compliance within the, the process, but how do we keep from being punitive or over-involved? One of the things that I've heard from staff all over the country in my other magnet work, it, when we start talking about accountability and compliance, they start to feel like you know everything's about monitoring and everything's about slapping their hands and being on the naughty list. And I think it's really important how you can create an expectation of compliance and participation and standardization without making it a punitive process. I think everyone deserves the opportunity for education, practice, support, and coaching, and maybe even remediation before we go down the road of, of you know, maybe counseling, coaching, those kinds of things where it can be a, a permanent part of the record, as, as they say. So think about those things related to competence and the, the, what about the competence of the coaches? Who's going to be there? Who's going to do what for you? So the second of the four key ex considerations is expectations. Can we create a program that is realistic for our team to implement and support? You really cannot expect miracles from this process. Rounding cannot fix a dysfunctional team or process. You know, if you have ineffective staffing or, or not enough staff, you can design the best practice out there, 
But if you're not able to implement that model the way that it's intended, the way you write it, the way you plan it, then staff, then staff are going to get even more frustrated and your, your outcomes are going to backfire. And we'll talk about that a little more as we get, get rolling. So who should set the expectations? The front line, the leadership, or both? Well, I hope all of you said, duh, it should be both. It really does need to be an initiative while it needs support from the top, which we'll also talk about here in a little bit. It also has to have that input from the front line. When we implemented rounding at a system that I worked at years ago, um, we really thought we were doing them a favor to give them a project in a box and here's all the materials you need, just open it up and off you go. They resented that. They didn't feel like they had had input into what was going to be realistic for them. They didn't have input into what tools they should be using. And it really backfired. We ended up with a lot of people who, with hurt feelings and our rounding was not successful. So I think that's an important consideration here. And, and I think some of you that may be in executive leadership positions, you need to assess where is your leadership at relative to um, the, the work that's being done. And I think some of you that attended the last webinar, we actually had a nice um, uh, toolkit for you that allowed you to go through and ask, ask some questions about what it is that, um, you know, who's on board, who isn't, those kinds of things that, that you can do with that. So um, I think we've hit, yeah, well, um, what do you expect rounding to do? We already talked about fixing that. So let's go to the next one. The last one is accountability. Or the next one is accountability. So think about, based on your history, how accountable are you as an organization? One of the simple tests that I use with organizations to really look at the accountability test is, is look at your key meetings in the organization and at all different levels, for nursing especially. Are people on time? Are they prepared? Are they ready to work? And, you know, is the attendance good? When you have issues with people can't even make it to meetings on time or they're not setting, sending emails responses in a timely manner by the expectations of the organization, you can almost begin to believe that you're not going to be as accountable as you think you are because that's a symptom. You know, the other thing sometimes um, that we see with, with this whole concept of accountability is do we meet our deadlines for other projects? You know, are we always scrambling at the end to make sure, you know, to get things done? Are we always that last-minute culture? Because I think those things are going to hurt you when you think about how you can really get a, a really hard wiring or engaging staff around rounding. So can we set expectations for lack of compliance? You know, right up front, I think it, you make it to staff's responsibility to determine what they believe is a minimum level of expectation. Sometimes you'll have go-getter star performing units that will actually say to you, we're going to be 100% because we're too east and nobody is as good as we are. Those are those kind of units that we just love because they're a team and they get each other excited and they're a little bit competitive. They make it really a very fun environment in which to really do our work. You'll always have those, or those units as well that are kind of on the laid back side or they've got a very, very dysfunctional if not toxic team and they're having so many problems already that they're never going to see this as an advantage for themselves or for their patients. They're just going to see it as one more thing I have to do. So I think you have to be really clear on how accountable are you, how do we set consequences for this compliance and, and for lack of compliance. And if we set those consequences, if we talk about our level of compliance, how do you enforce that? without being punitive. There may come a time with individuals where you do have to think about individual counseling if they really are not on board and are not doing it. Uh, one of the tricks or, about this process though is how do you track that? If you're using manual paperwork, if you're using you know, forms that people fill out, it's, it's sort of easy to dry lab, as we used to say um, when I taught students in clinical. You know, it's easy to go back and fill those in and say, oh, yeah, I rounded every hour and we marked it on the sheet. But you don't know if they did or not. But, but I think you do have to get some clarity around what do we do with those folks who just don't get with the program and why aren't they getting there. And I think, I think we will um, get a little deeper into that as we go through our hour here. The last of the four considerations is resources. Do we have the resource to, to launch this program this year? Think about your master calendar. We'll go into more detail about that in a little bit. But think about the master calendar. What time of year do you actually do big things? 
do you do all of your staff evaluations at the same time every year for everybody? So that's certainly not the same month you want to start rounding. Are you up to your eyeballs in budget preparation at a certain time of year? Do we know that it's going to interfere with our joint commission visit? Do we know it's going to you know, coincide with the 120th anniversary of the hospital? And there's all kinds of other fun activities that are happening. So I think it's, it's really important to think about that. But also, do we have enough people? Are we going to get the support from up above and at the unit level from the staff? And can they support that process long enough to make it successful. I think one of the things that the staff tell me all the time is that the term of, you know, flavor of the month and we're moving on to the next thing. We all have probably heard the, um, the old adage that it takes 21 days for something to become a habit. And, but when we think about the 21 days, I just would challenge you to think about this. How many weeks does it take a, a 12 hour staff nurse um, working three 12-hour shifts to get in 21 days of, of habit change. That's seven weeks. Think about, are you prepared to provide support for people for seven weeks? Or are you really only going to provide support for somebody for three shifts that they work? Is that enough to get true practice change and true engagement around something new to make it a strong standardized process. So you really have to think ahead about that. I mean, that's a lot of time when you, and I, I don't know that I've ever seen, an, I shouldn't say ever, but there are very few initiatives out there that actually um, continue that, you know, go live type support long enough in, 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 like they need to for something like this. So this is where we're going to stop and we're going to do our one chat for today. We're going to take, take it easy on you because it's a Friday. Um, but Think about, if you would, which of the bear, which of these four areas do you think is going to be a barrier for you or your team? Which might be the biggest issue that you, you know, you might have a couple of them going on. So if we could just take a few minutes, I'm going to slide my, my bar back up here so I can kind of see the questions in the chat so I can see if anybody is, uh, how people are doing. Um, so please just take a minute and start typing it in. Like we've got quite a few accountability, a few expectations within that. I haven't got a lot of people answering yet. I hope you'll take, oh, here's one. I'm having a little trouble. I need to expand my screen, but it's not letting me. So, um, but um, obviously, uh, I think we're going to see a little bit of a smattering of all kinds of different things. Resources, expectations, accountability from leadership to assist with ongoing support and implementation, that's a good one too. So we're going to hit a few of those things as we go on. Uh, we'll take just a minute. I think we have a few people that could still answer if they choose to. We'd like to have you do that. Accountability with three exclamation points. Hallelujah there, right? So I, I think that uh, accountability is just a, it's, it's a nebulous concept for some of us. It's hard to move forward. Those of you that are thinking about it and, you know, want to keep going, feel free. You can enter your answer as we go on. But I think it's, I think our biggest issues that, that you've identified are really around accountability and expectations. I think that we can teach people to be competent. And I think if you're going to do this, you can probably find the resources. But these two are the, are the tricky ones. We may be able to, maybe it sounds like I might need to do a webinar in the future on, on how do you establish accountability in an organization. That might be a fun one for all of us. As, let's go ahead and we'll uh, go back to the advantages and disadvantages of rounding at this point. How are you doing on? Oh, real good on time. So, so let's look at the advantages of consistent rounding. And I purposely put the word consistent in there because you really aren't going to see very many advantages at all unless you're doing the process you've set up consistently. The thing that makes a difference is the, is the ability to be able to create a workflow that 
makes the patient trust you. They understand that you're going to come and you're going to be there for them. And that's part of the real big piece of hourly rounding that I think people don't get. So some of the benefits to staff, fewer call lights and interruptions, um, the, the teamwork, you know, if we're helping each other out, um, and again, depending on which tool or process or digital application that you use, there may be some cues and some triggers that will help you um, to be able to, um, you know, see when the patients are due for their next round and when they're, you know, how do we divide that up if somebody gets busy. Improve communication. If people are working together to make sure the patients get rounded on, it, it creates a, a higher level of communication. People know a little bit more about all the patients on the unit or several patients on the unit, not just the ones that they're directly assigned to. It can definitely help with time management. If you plan your tasks and your interventions and your education around those hourly touch points, it, it typically, again, results in fewer call lights and fewer interruptions from staff wanting something that they don't, that you haven't provided already. The other thing I've seen, and the data, you know, I've been doing a, a lit search right that lately around rounding and leader rounding. We don't have a lot of hard data around reduced turnover of staff, but anytime you can increase the feelings of teamwork and communication, you're going to be doing better. Some of the patient and family benefits include improved satisfaction, improved safety, increased trust, engagement in the plan of care, because, you know, they start to think, oh, they're coming back in an hour and we're going to do this, this, and this. Control over their needs. They can let people know at that hourly visit what they, what they think they're going to need in the next hour. And they have much lower anxiety over their needs being met. The other thing that I'm seeing in the literature a little bit is the idea that the responsiveness scores for nursing services within patient satisfaction surveys and HCAPs has started to go up for many organizations. That's actually one of the few outcomes in a systematic review study that I was looking at that actually showed a, a real consistency in terms of improvement for data. So responsiveness is a big thing. So um, the disadvantages of inconsistent rounding. So, you know, the unmet expectations of the team and the patients. People start to resent each other to say, gosh, I got all these patients and I'm tied up. Um, you know, what's going on? You know, nobody's helping me. Nurses are notorious, I think, of, or nursing staff are notorious for not asking for help. We never want to feel like we're the wing leak in the chain. But I do think that it, if you don't, if you do rounding well, it does help people feel that way. Um, failure to meet your quality goals. If you don't do it consistently, you're going to have falls. People are not going to be happy. You're paying assessments and reassessments if they're part of your, your five Ps or your three Ps. Those things are not going to be managed, and the data related to those are not going to be good. The patient and the family, again, we talked a little bit about that mistrust. And, and you're, because they can't trust you that you're really going to come in an hour, then they literally are on the light because they're afraid nobody's coming, especially I think we see this more in the elderly. You know, folks that, that maybe don't have as clear of time orientation when they're in the hospital. Um, it is it is time lasts forever in the hospital. I was hospitalized when I was pregnant many, many years ago for nine days on bed rest. And I'll tell you, those hours were so long and I really felt like nobody would ever came in my room. So, you know, don't set expectations that you can't meet. It just causes more problems down the road. So let's talk about a little bit about identifying our key stakeholders. So the, the, we, I've identified for you within the program here six key stakeholder groups that are typical to an hourly rounding initiative, but they're not exclusive by any means to, um, you know, there can be other stakeholders in your organization depending on how big it is, depending on whether it's a, a um, teaching hospital or not. There may be resident or, or uh, faculty physicians and folks like that who may be part of this because they have to understand what the nursing staff or the team is trying to do. Some places implement hourly rounding as a full multidisciplinary program where they literally expect the respiratory and PT and OT and even residents or doctors to round if they're in the room at the time the round is due. So your stakeholder groups may differ slightly from the stakeholder groups, but I hope this will kind of give you an idea of how to start to identify your key stakeholders. So let's start at, with the executive team champions. You know, executive team has got to advocate for the support and the resources, and at least one of you in the chat indicated that, that that accountability for support and resources from the from the leadership was was really important to you. And I think it is. The other thing is visible support. 
you know, we all have to buy in that we're going to do this and it's going to take extra work time, it's going to take education time for staff to learn how to do it well, there's maybe monitoring, there's maybe data reporting. All those things are part of the budget and part of our productive hours. And so they have to support that, but I also think this is a critical time for them to be visible. There's nothing worse than, you know, staff who, who especially if this initiative sort of started at the board or came down from the top, we really want to do this and you guys can help us develop how, but we're going to do it. That kind of an initiative, if they're, if the leaders are not out there being visible, supporting the team, showing them that they appreciate the effort it's taking to learn this new process, you're going to have some key players who are not going to engage. There are those that, that always notice when executive leadership is not coming around and I think that's a very important concept. The second layer or the second group of stakeholders are the nursing leadership champions. You know, we need to think about who is the champion for this project within the nursing department and or maybe those, those champions, I say nursing leadership champions, but it might be department leadership champions. Maybe you've got an interprofessional group that's working on this and who's partnering with, from IT uh, with nursing leadership or who are, who's going to help us to coordinate the stakeholders. Who is going to help to energize our coaches? Maybe even select those individuals who might be our super users or our coaches. The third group are the nursing team members. You know, there's, there's key design specialists to support their work. So think about how we design what we do and, and not just overlay an hourly rounding process that just because it was in the literature or just because it worked down the road at, at you know, such and such a hospital, university or whatever, doesn't mean that it'll, that it'll work the same way for you. And I think it's really important when you start to look at engaging stakeholders that those frontline staff that are going to be expected to do it have the chance to think about the rounding processes that you're considering and compare those to their existing workflows. Look at within their own day or their own shift, where do I see something falling between the cracks because, oh, yeah, I can do hourly rounding, but I'm also accountable to go in and do all the quality controls on the three glucometers that we have on the unit. Or I, I'm accountable to go down and pick up, you know, dietary trays at that time. So you really have to think about the things that they need to help to design it. If they're helping to design it and we've looked at how it fits into what we're already doing to enhance what we're doing rather than overlaying more work on top or even conflicting with what we're doing, you'll see that ownership. You'll see those staff start to own the program, start to enjoy the program. And again, like our star units, actually cheerleader around the program that is there. So I kind of jumped ahead. I do this all the time. I always get ahead of my slides. But um, that again, the ancillary or support staff, are, are they going to be rounding partners with us? You know, OT, PT, pharmacy, whoever. Um, and then peer feedback and communication. You know, those folks that are out there on the floor, you've got a physical therapist that may be ambulating a patient and, and, you know, out of the corner of their ear, here's what's going on in the room. If they feel that what we're doing in the room is just by rote and it's not purposeful and it's not, you know, sitting down and really engaging or really looking the patient in the eye and, and asking the questions that we want asked in a meaningful, kind, and engaged way, you know, you're only going to know that if people can get some feedback and people can communicate that. And how you set up a safe environment for feedback can be another major challenge. Nurses are terrible at positive feedback. They don't like to even be praised. We're so humble. And getting negative feedback can, can be threatening to people, and it's really, really difficult. So just think about them as a stakeholder group who may be helpful to you, depending on what model you choose to use. The quality and patient experience staff. These individuals, and I think almost every hospital in America now has assigned individuals to, pa to patient experience who are accountable to go around and teach people about the scoring method on the survey and, you know, key keywords and aid it and some of those things that we, we teach people to do. Um, I think that everybody has those people. Be sure you use them as part of your planning and implementation, but also don't let them take over the planning and implementation so it doesn't have meaning for nursing. Yes, we have to have clearly defined and measurable compliance and outcome data, but we also don't want the staff to feel like quality department is pushing this down their throat either. And the last group that we'll talk about, again, if you're going up with an application, um, you know, if it's, it's an online application or a digital application or something electronic, you really do need to engage with the right 
support from IT for the customization of the launch, the assistance, and maybe even the design of reports or the rollout of reports as things get going. So I think stakeholder analysis, you know, I like to think about our six groups here and what stake do they have in the project? What do we need from them? What are their, per their perceived attitudes or risks? And what is the risk if they're not engaged? Now, obviously, if you don't get the CFO engaged or you don't have even the chief nurse engaged, you're going to have some problems. You need to very clearly identify what you need from these people and get some clarity up front on whether they have the time and the resources to provide you with what you're expecting of them and don't spring it on them too late. You know, If, if they have to work this into their already busy schedule, if they're a, a quality patient experience person or, or an ancillary support department, you've got to make sure that what their master calendar looks like. You've got to be sure they have the time or the expertise or the competence to do this work for you. So think about and, and, and we're, again, we're not going to spend too much time right now looking at this stakeholder piece, but I like this slide because I think if you go down each of the groups that you identify as stakeholders and you really think, how much influence does each have on the success of the project? Where are the areas where you really have to get that individual on board or you're not going to be successful? The make or break if that particular individual or role isn't on board. And I think that it's really important that you do a risk assessment of that nature because sometimes we poo-poo people and go, oh, well, we don't care if they're on board or not. It won't bother us. We'll just do this in our department anyway. Well, guess what? You are going to hit a wall eventually if you have that attitude. And, and the better part of Valor is to engage with those folks up front. Again, find out how much time they have, enlist their help, get their ideas. Everybody's going to have a better project if we do it that way. Wow, we're about halfway through. I hope you're enjoying it. That's the one thing I hate about webinars. I can't really get feedback. So let's start now on how you begin to define what you need. Again, what meets Little Community Hospital isn't going to necessarily be the same as what meets the needs of large academic teaching hospitals. So let's look first at what population do you serve? You know, you're going to have different rounding needs for ICU for mental health, behavioral health. You're going to have different needs in rehab. You'll have different needs in ambulatory settings. You know, just because um, a patient is not in a bed doesn't mean they don't, they, you know, wouldn't benefit from some sort of round. It might not be hourly. So how often do they need to be seen? That kind of takes me right into that. Mental health patients may not require an hourly round, but are there purposeful points within their care trajectory while they're in acute care where we should round with them and check in with them and see what they need? The same with ICU. If you've got somebody that is comatose and you're really in there almost constantly because of the critical nature, are we really rounding on them or are we rounding on their, pay, their family members? And what kind of difference will rounding be when we're actually talking to a patient as opposed to talking to a supportive family member or care partner? The other thing we want to be sure that we look at is um, do our staff have the ability to meet those needs? You know, I remember when I worked labor and delivery years ago that we, we always had those patients that had the expectation that they would never have a twinge of pain. They, they had set their expectations so high that, well, I'll just get my epidural and it'll all be good. Well, guess what? It doesn't always work that way. And are we very clear on what the expectations are for the outcomes of our rounding, for the experiences of the patients provided by our rounding, and are we all on the same page, the patients, the family, the staff, and the leaders, on what we're going to get out of this? And I think that's really important. So what wow experiences can we safely provide for our patients? One of the tools you'll get at the end of this session is uh, another, a couple of our toolkits, just like we did last time. And one of those toolkits is how to create wow experiences. So we've collected a lot of things from, from you know, best practices out there. Maybe you're doing all of them already. Maybe some of them are new to you. So hopefully it'll be something that'll, that'll kind of bring that together for you. Now let's move on and talk a little bit about staff mix and scheduling. What team members are available every shift? Now think about where's the consistency in reinforcing and monitoring the, the rounding process going to come if there's different people that are expected to watch everybody. Think about who is going to be available so you've got somebody there. Which patient needs can they meet? You know, how do we document and track the task completed 
while they're in the patient room? Or do we document and track tasks after they get out of the room? Are people expected to log into the electronic medical record to doc document this? Are we using a different app? Are we using manual paper? You know, how will we document? I think those are very important things. And you have to look at are the expectations and skills and competence going to be different between what we expect an RN to do compared to what we expect a CNA to do, or maybe even what we expect, you know, the respiratory therapist to do if they happen to be there for their for during that hour. So I think it's an important thing to do. And then how will we know who needs a visit and when? Um, you know, there are definitely applications out there that allow you to track that when the when the next round is due, those kinds of things. But we have to figure that out. Because if you do get tied up with a patient, somebody is going to have to pick up the ball um, because that's what happens. Nurses get tied up with patients. So think about those two elements. So the, the next element is let's look at, talk, think a minute about goals and outcomes of our rounding experience. On the left, I have listed compliance. These are things, these are measurements, these are, these are elements of data that you can report that can help you to cheerlead with your team to say, hey, guess what? Four East is, has a 95% rounding compliance this month. You know, that means they completed them. Well, did they complete them on time? There's another great goal to do. The number of concerns that were addressed, for, you know, if they were identified, were they addressed within one day, two days, three days? You can set that up however you wish. The number of staff members who were praised. Is it our goal to try to give so many wow experiences that the patients and their families are just running at the mouth with great things that they want to say about RCF? And the, the timeliness of the issues we've already talked about. What about nurse leader follow-up? Are we nursing leaders follow, following up appropriately when there are staff who aren't doing it or there are concerns that, that the patient had? Um, what's your total rounding time? You know, how long does it take to round when you're in there? I mean, you know, that may sound funny, but, you know, if you're getting in and out of the room in two minutes, that's probably not an effective round. You can't do everything unless the patient's asleep and you chart that. that so I think it's, it's really important that you think about compliance. Those are our completed tasks. They expect us to do that. They expect us to be there. And that's different from these outcomes that we see on the right-hand column. The outcomes are where we really have to connect the dots on so what we're doing this added activity what are we why are we doing it how do we justify the expense or the time for our staff and you know when you get down to the bottom line and your CNO has to go back next year and budget for something or or they want to be sure that that they continue to have the staffing patterns that they need to be successful sometimes these outcomes and proving that hourly rounding um, is, is important is, is a huge part of the of the finance picture so let's talk now a little bit about launching a rounding plan. I think it's important to, uh, to think about the steps in what you're going to do. So I, I spoke up briefly earlier about identifying the timeline and the priorities. Does your facility have a master calendar? You know, that's a great question. If we had a little time, we'd, and we probably could if we wanted to, but we could make a little chat to say, you know, how many of you really have a master calendar? I can't tell you the number of facilities that I've been in where there is no such thing as a master calendar. There's no place you can go to to say, hey, if anything else launching next, you know, three weeks from Thursday, what am I conflicting with? Some places are really good about it, other places not. The things we mentioned earlier, annual standing deadlines, evaluations, budget, celebration, corporate strategic projects. Is this going to interfere, is a nursing division rounding initiative going to interfere with the strategic priority to launch new, you know, mission, vision, and values? Or with, an, uh, with a strategic corporate initiative to open up a new orthopedic wing and all those resources are, are used there? Just think about a little bit about what is going to get in the way from a timeline and a milestone perspective. So think about your unit level goals and events. Think about the things that happen at the unit level that you need to consider. Are you going to want to launch rounding right when you're in the middle of your new grad hiring cycle? You might because then everybody's learning at once and sometimes, you know, the new grads have learned about it in school. They might be your most compliant players. But that's a lot of more work to put on people who are already precepting or already charge nurses. 
what about high census time? Do you want to try to launch a new thing like rounding when it's super high in the middle of the winter or, you know, over over 4th of July in the ED when, you know, you're going to be nothing but the fireworks club that comes in with injuries and, you know, dog bites because their dog got spooked and all those things. So you really have to kind of think about how this will work. This will guide the organization also to decide, are we going to do a one big happy go live where everybody goes up at the same time, or are we going to do a cascade of, of activation or go live where we start in, in two units and then we add two more units or you know on and on so that we don't overwhelm our patient experience folks or quality folks who are, or IT folks who are trying to support us. So you know, who are your change facilitators? Who are those key stakeholders? What, you know, what is their availability? We talked about that. Create the go-live date and then work backward for, for planning and forward to ongoing on the unit support and coaching. You know, plan for six weeks at a minimum, do you think? I mean, how often do we really plan to have support around that long to keep, an, you know, to keep the excitement going, to monitor people's behaviors, to make sure that people, you know, feel good about what they're doing? Remember our 21-day habit-changing uh, expectation. We're not going to get there if that individual's only worked four shifts in that time that we're on the unit. So how do you select a tool to achieve your goals? Well, every organization has to look at the components of the hourly or purposeful round. You know, I've again in reviewing the literature this year, I've seen some that have you know four Ps, the five Ps, the three Ps, the you know, some people don't like to use P, they use a different word. But we really have to think about what are the questions or activities that we need to do? How often are we going to do them? How are, they, how are we going to make the assignment of the round? Who's going to do when? How are we going to document it? How do we handle service recovery when we can't do it, as we promised? What kind of real-time tools will we put in the hands of the nurses so they can fix it right away when it happens and not just apologize? What can we give them that will make staff feel, or the patients, excuse me, feel like we're listening to them and that we, you know, sorry we didn't get back in here, our bad, here, have a little whatever, or please accept our apologies. How are we going to praise the staff that are doing it well? How do we praise the people doing it well without disengaging the people uh, who then will I think that, you know, oh, she's a pet or he's, a, he's always a star, nobody ever watches me. You know, it's, it's always a balance on how do you recognize people appropriately without going over the top or offending people who like real over-the-top recognition. So just something else to think about. And then back to that data metrics and reports. How often are we going to do that? And I think we'll talk a little more about that. So let's talk about gaining buy-in from these stakeholders. Remember we, had our, we identified our key departments and identified our key contacts. Um, what's in it for them, kind of, you know, what do we need from them, but what's in it for them? What are they going to gain from doing this work with us? And I think that that's an important piece of this as well. <clears throat> How do we match their needs to yours, or the needs of nursing, or the needs of the unit level staff? So if you think about, I love this little schematic, and these are just names of staff. If you think about the level of power and the level of interest, and you, you can kind of plot your people that if they're powerful, and we definitely need to keep them satisfied. If they're a, a strong stakeholder, and we definitely want to make sure that we keep them engaged. Um, but there's also the how do we man manage them closely? You know, it's, there's four different elements of here. We monitor them, we keep them informed, we keep them satisfied, and we manage them closely. So I think it's important to really think about that. Again, I can't stress enough stakeholder influence. Gauging the arenas of influence and leveraging the relief, the influence that you can create before, during, and after the decision and the go-live is a critical factor. Put a little star on your notes on that because you've got to have the right people behind you or, or the staff are going to feel like they've been betrayed. So let's look a little bit now at education and training. Um, you know, you're going to have to have content experts. People people who can help with you know, validation and pilot programming of the of the uh, initiative, you're going to also have to have some process experts. And we're talking just about the training now. We're not talking about the whole model, but think about how we're going to educate people. 
You know, we've got to have people who know what we're teaching. We also have people who know how to get the technology or your learning management system up and going. Are you going to push out an email alert to everybody to say, hey, click on the link and complete the hourly rounding training? Are we going to schedule life, you know, real life training? Maybe bring some treats. You know, um, how do, who's going to schedule that? Who's going to track who attended? How are we going to make up courses for the people who couldn't be there? What do you do with Susie who happened to be on maternity leave, you know, all to, all 10 weeks while you were on the unit supporting, and then she comes back, and, and support is gone. So you need to think about that ongoing support and real-time support. You know, sometimes it, you don't get the support until you're so far into the bad habits or you're so discouraged that you can't function anymore, and that's not good either. We talked before about monitoring, coaching, and remediation. Do you have checklists that people can follow at the beginning? Um, you know, again, some of the online tools give you the, the checklist is built right in. It's an easy cue. Um, online audits within your tool, things that will give you a report on who is doing it well, what time are they going in, things like that. And then uh, lastly, don't forget leader and coach training. If the leaders don't know how to do the rounds themselves, if they aren't forced to practice going in to do an hourly round, so they know the steps as well as the staff on, on what is involved in an hourly round, we're talking, you know, nursing leaders, if they don't know that process as well as their staff, then how can they go in and do a leader round, that the purpose of which is to, to monitor what's happening, to, to assess any concerns with staff who may not be doing it well, or issues that with our process that aren't the staff's fault, but just we set up a bad process. Don't forget them and make them accountable as well. So often we poo-poo the leadership and go, oh yeah, we're rolling this out, we're going to have all these training sessions for the staff, and here, here's a packet, you guys read through it. Well, you and I both know, any of us who've been managers or directors, sometimes the packet gets to the bottom of the stack pretty darn fast when, when things are piling up, and you may or may not have a chance to even skim it, let alone practice it so you can be a credible coach and a credible cheerleader for your staff. I, I'm, it's one of my, as you can probably tell, soapbox moments when it comes to leader um, training about any kind of initiative that you do. So how are we going to support the rounding team uh, once we get things going? So anticipate relapse. Those of you that attended my previous webinar, we talked a lot about um, Di Clementi and Prochaska's change man model and their concept of relapse. You know, every change is going to have some element of relapse. We have to plan for it. Rather than be surprised by it later and, and, and sad about it, we should be ready. We should have built-in reinforcements of what we expect and reinforcements of compliance. We should build that into the one-year plan. Don't just say, oh, be educated, it's going to be great. You've got to think about the drift that's going to occur from the way people are, are in, initiated. You know, you always see that bump at the beginning where everybody's doing it because we're watching them and we're helping them, and then it starts to drift off. Those organizations on the line that are magnet hospitals know what a, what a, a deadly sin that can be because you've got to sustain those outcomes if you're going to use great work like this as a magnet story. So it's best to learn how to do it now and get it over with. I'm a real believer in the daily debrief as well, real-time corrections. Let's not wait until we start to see our Prescani data and then wonder why it's not getting better. Let's really get some clarity around, geez, that's not working at all. You know, it is not going to work for us to do, for the CNAs to do the rounding on the even hours or the odd hours because they've got other tasks to do or whatever. I think you really need to... Think about the clinical staff, anticipate the off shift. Maybe for every little huddle you have, you create a, a bulleted sheet that can be saved for the off shift so the people that maybe weren't working can do a quick scan and catch up on the information they missed. Monitor their stress and coping. Our previous program talked a lot about Bridges transition model and the stress that can occur for people who don't transition as fast psychologically as the change is happening around them situationally. So really look at people. Are you seeing absenteeism? Are you seeing defiance even? Are you seeing silence or withdrawal? Those are all signs of stress. They're not necessarily people being actively disengaged right up front. It is really sometimes people who are so stressed by it and they're afraid to ask for help. So think about that. Let's go on a little bit to, to specific support at Go Live. 
Communication, communication, communication. I mean, absolutely, again, back to competing priorities for GoLive, the measuring the, the, the metrics, keeping the stakeholders informed of the progress. Once we've engaged them and they've said, yep, we'll, we'll support you, we're on it, you've got to have a process to give, give them a daily or a weekly or, or hourly, if you will, um, a progress report. They want to know that this project that they've invested in, that they went out on a limb to you know, sell to their boss, and get the resources you needed, they want to know if it's working or if it's not. They don't want to be surprised by anything that they weren't expecting uh, when, when things happen. So um, individualized communication and education, not everybody learns the same way. It's a great thing to have an online program or even classes, but sometimes you just need to take somebody by the elbow and be in the room with them and help them walk through it, help them to it, develop a nice, a nice, not a script, if you will, but a nice flow of conversation where they feel comfortable and help them to understand how they can document and talk to the patient at the same time. That's another skill to be learned. And again, the schedule for Go Live, we've talked about it, um, you know, ad nauseum, sorry, I'm just, it's one of my things. Monitoring compliance and celebrating successes. I think that it's important to really establish right up front what reports are we going to need. This is what we want to measure as an outcome. Got it. We want to see a difference in falls or we want to see a difference in call lights. So going back over to which tasks do we need to, comp to, do we need to consistently complete to get that outcome? And what, re what are we going to do to monitor that? Is that an online thing? Is it a tick sheet? Is it direct observation by you know, the charge nurse or the supervisor or somebody that actually you know, kind of walks around and audits a certain number of rounds every single week um, you know, from a randomly selected staff? There's lots of different ways to do things that way. So are we going to do daily, weekly, monthly? What kind of ongoing data do you need to justify your program? So let's talk a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about individual and unit level data. You know, um, um, some of you may have units where you post everybody's compliance on a certain thing, or, you know, all the list of, of nurses and here's your percentage of compliance with, with your central line dressing changes or your, or your rounding or your hand washing or whatever it is. Um, think about the benefits or the disadvantages of that where you can engage some people or you could actively disengage people. You can also pit the stars against the, against the struggling because they start to get jealous and they start to feel like, you know, Susie's doing this so she's, you know, everybody likes her better or whatever. You really want to be very careful about how you use individual level data and, and whether that's a public forum or a private forum and, you know, trying to find out is that individual data driven to begin with? There are those people that could care less about numbers. You know, they're just all about, you know, the emotional attachment to the patient. How do you tie in what you're trying to teach them about rounding with what their, what resonates for them around a change and around why they come to work every day? You've got to help them connect the dots. I love team data because I think when you can watch your team data go up, it's more cohesive. It helps the team to, to really come together to say, hey, we're going to be too east or, or, you know, we're going to be better than the, than, than the orthopedic unit or whatever. Um, Division and executive team involvement in celebrations. You've got to celebrate. There aren't enough opportunities to celebrate in nursing as it is. I mean, really, there aren't. And I think that, that it's really an important thing if you can make sure that your exec team's there, those big stakeholders that, that signed on make the time, that the CNO makes the time and is always out there recognizing and even coming in for the off shift. And, and creating some kind of ongoing awards for top performers. You know you see that with patient satisfaction data, which is a lot of times the data that we're trying to improve with rounding uh, or, or safety data. Think about those awards. And, you know, Press Ganey has offers them for their clients. PRC offers them. You know, Picker. There's all kinds of different groups, and they offer these awards for their outstanding hospitals. You know, again, scorecards, incentives, there's lots of things that we can do. So. We're kind of coming to the end of our program, and um, I want to review for you really quickly the steps that we're going to take to get your CE, and then we're going to go ahead and, and backtrack a minute. We're going to open it up for any questions that you may have. Um, either put them in the question section or in the chat, and please feel free to contact me. I love this work. 
I wouldn't be working where I work for Noble if I really didn't believe in the value of rounding and connecting one-on-one -on -one with patients in a meaningful way. If I can be of any help, or again, if you would like to schedule a webinar for your team, we would be happy to do that for you because you know we're about more than just product sales. We're really a lot about making sure people get good care. That's what we do. So watch for an email that will come from Noble Health today. Follow the link to complete the program evaluation, and I believe we give you a week or a little more maybe to do that. And then watch for another email that will have your certificate. So print and retain your certificate of attendance, and then uh, um, you should have your CE. And, and please hold on to that. We will keep our records as required, but we don't have the resources to necessarily do that for a long time. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up my little box. I think you guys can probably see it. I never can quite get that to shut off. Um, go ahead if you've got any questions. I apologize that we sort of have to type them in because that's the way these webinar programs work, but I will take a few minutes. Uh, comments, uh, evaluations of, of my skill are also welcome if you'd like to take a minute. Thank you. Okay. I'm glad you liked it. Any questions? Coming up. Katie, are you seeing anything that I'm missing here at all? I'm not the nope. best. I don't I don't see any questions. Someone said that they, they love the presentation and you're getting a lot of great kudos, but it doesn't seem like there's any questions right now. Okay. Well, uh, and again, you know, you'll we'll be, we'll be happy to send out this slide deck for you, and I'm very happy to have you jot down my phone number or my um, email address. Happy to happy to visit with you. I'm usually on site in the in in our office on Fridays, so you can almost always catch me on a Friday. Uh, but this. Um, my phone number is 24-7, so uh, anytime. Um, I get up at 5. Um, no, I get up at 6, and I go to bed at 9, so I'm kind of an early bird. So I thank you all for coming. I really appreciate um, the great turnout. We had a lot of folks who attended, and we're tickled with that. And we hope that you benefited from the program. And if you want more information about our services or our company, uh, feel free, again, to contact myself or go to the Noble website. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Terry, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. As Terry mentioned, you'll be receiving an email here shortly within the next hour that will have a link so that way you can complete your program evaluation. And then we will also be sending out those certificates once we receive those. And then also there's been a few questions that I've gotten on email during the presentation about the toolkit. So be on the lookout for those in email as well. I hope everyone has a great weekend, and we hope you join us again on one of these webinars in the future. Watch for number three. It'll be coming yet this fall. <laughs> great. Thank you, Terry. Bye-bye. Thanks, Katie, for your technical support. I, I always need tech support. <laughs> <laughs> you did great. <laughs> well, everybody have a good weekend. I'm going to sign off then, Katie.